choosing a drum throne height is something that I've seen a lot of conversation about. Uh, I professionally am a personal trainer, exercise specialist, and a muscle specialist. And fortunately enough, I'm a consultant to a lot of professional athletes and fitness professionals. And one of the things I see a lot is that people need to modify their chair height in their car and at home to try to help with back pain. Now, back pain and drumming has been something that's just almost synonymous. If you play drums, you can expect to have back pain, or if you've got back pain and you play drums, it's probably from playing drums. Uh, this isn't necessarily true. And there's a lot of different variables and things that you can modify to make sure that you don't get pain in your body. And forgetting about pain, ultimately get the best performance while playing drums and keeping your body in a safe position. So we're gonna explore some of those variables today. We're gonna to talk about some structures, some of the things you need to consider with the muscle tissue, and I wanna show you guys a really quick and easy way to assess your active range of motion to help you customize your drum throne height to your specific drum set. And it's not just drum throne height, but how wide should these pedals be? Because unfortunately, how wide the pedal should be from the snare drum out and how high you should be have to be considered together. So step one is understanding what structures are involved with the human body and where you're sitting. So we're not going to get too in-depth. This isn't going to be a thorough anatomy lesson, but as you guys probably can imagine, this is your spinal system, and the spinal system is comprised of the cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, sacrum, and the coccyx. The other bone we need to look at is this big hunk and bone, which is your thigh bone, and this thigh bone is called your femur. Now, when you're assessing how high you should sit on the throne, two things we really need to consider. One is this bone and this big round ball and socket going into this acetabulum here. And what kind of motion can happen in what's called the sagittal plane, which is kind of like the front to back motion, and then the transverse plane, which is the outside and inside motion. So we're going to wait till we actually get on the drum set to look at that. Now, the one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is really what this lumbar spine is really good at doing. Now, if you look at the spine, most of us are familiar with how the curves of the spine are, right? You got this curve this way in the cervical spine, curve this way in the thoracic spine, and this curve in the lumbar spine. Now, if you ever get back pain or an injury and you talk to a chiropractor or a physician, most of the time for people, it's in this lumbar area. L1, L2, L3, most of the time it's L5, S1 herniated discs, pain, what have you. Sometimes it's SI or sciatica. In any event, this kind of all falls into that same category. You'll see what I mean in a second. What's interesting about this spine is it, since it's curved backwards, structurally, it's really pretty good at extending backward. And you can see there are these things called articular facets in the back, and as you bend back, they lock up pretty good. And that's part of their function to going into extension. What you'll notice is they're not so good at going into flexion, right? If I try to bend this model, I don't know if you guys can see it in the camera so well, if I smash this model, it gets pretty much too straight, but not flexion. Now that's gonna be really important when we get to the active range of motion section. So we wanna try and find somewhere where this spine can stay relatively neutral. And relative is gonna be different for each of us because if you're an older player or someone who has a very different posture, and structurally this is just where you're more comfortable, uh, we don't want to force this posture. A position like this might be more comfortable for you. But we need to be aware that the lumbar spine is really good at staying in extension and going into extension. It's not so good at flexing, and it's not super good at rotation, because I can't really show you here very well with this camera, but these articular facets, when they turn, they lock up real good. So you don't want to be twisting too much from this area. Part of that is if you're too far back into extension, those facets lock up more and you can't move as much. So the other thing we need to look at is with this femur, when this sits in the ball and socket here, right, the motions that we're pretty good at moving in are the sagittal plane, at least from this seated position. And there is this amount of motion that's called horizontal abduction or leg out to the side motion in this plane, which we need to consider when we're looking at assessing the drums and figuring out where we're gonna sit. So let's talk about some practical application. How does that anatomy thing we just talked about, and please, if you have more questions, I'll leave my email below. Feel free to email me. I'll be happy to talk to you more about this and do a follow-up. If this YouTube video goes well, I'll gladly create a bunch more videos about kind of all the rest of the drum set and uh, how to optimize your performance. So let's talk about how we can practically apply this. 
How does this relate to you and you as a drummer? So you got this anatomy thing in your mind, you know, that the spine's pretty good at, at being an extension or neutral, but it's not so good at being in flexion, right? Well, so why is that important? Well, based off your leg length and where your throne is, it's going to modify what kind of forces go up into your spine. So as an example, without really talking about assessing this too much, and this isn't a drum throne, this is just a stool. If I sit on this stool and I lower it down all the way, low as it can possibly go, you guys can see that by sitting here with my arms just in front of me a little bit, that my back is kind of rounded forward a little bit, right? So if I want to sit in a neutral spine, I got to kind of work hard to get there. Now, part of that is as I lower my legs, my legs have lost something called active range of motion. So it's the range of motion that I can voluntarily go through. I kind of pushed into a range where I'm not so good at. How do I know that? Well, I know my body, but I'll show you really quick. If you sit here, and you try to pick your leg up off the ground. Right now, I can't pick my leg off the ground here really good. Now, if I raise this back up, if I assess hip flexion range of motion, so I bring this leg up all the way, this is as high as I can lift my leg, and you can even see I just moved in my spine. So if I keep my spine still, this is as high as I can lift my leg. And if I keep my spine still, this is how high as I can lift the other leg. Now, what happens is with the human body, when you run into motion at, at one joint, but you're trying to do a task, your body will find the range of motion at another joint. So if I continue to lift this leg up and I really force it, my body will be able to bring my knee higher toward my shoulder. But as you can see, I have to flex my spine to get there, right? Hip flexion, spinal flexion. So if I go back down now, because you can see this hip flexion motion is the knee toward my shoulder. If I lower this throne now, well, look at what happened. This knee is now closer towards my shoulder, and now this is more of that hip flexion. Now, this is really close to the max amount of hip flexion that I have available. Therefore, my body has voluntarily chosen, I should say involuntarily chosen, to round my spine a little bit to make me a little bit more comfortable here. Now, from a drum set playing perspective, when you're playing drums, if you're practicing or you're performing, you're playing from 20 minutes to 8 hours, depending on what kind of schedule you have. Therefore, if I'm in this position for an extended period of time, and this is the max amount of hip flexion I have, but I'm in perform mode, right? I'm not thinking about what my body's doing. I'm playing double bass. I'm playing uh, hi-hat patterns with my left foot. My body's going to find the motion wherever it needs to, right? So if I just take my foot, my left leg, and I do like kind of like a stomping bass drum thing, you guys can see that I have to pick up some of that motion in my lower back. The significance of that is over time, that's a lot of extra motion, right? If you think about the number of times you play a bass drum pattern in one song and you're sitting too low, right? You get one of these guys, these old cats who are sitting like this and they're playing the bass drum like this. Every time you hit the bass drum, that's motion into your lower back. Not bad in a short term period of time, but that starts to create wear on the cartilage and it can eventually lead to not such pleasant things like osteoarthritis and other problems. So here's my suggestion to you. Put your throne up pretty high to start. And you're going to check your range of motion in the sagittal plane. And then we're going to add the pedals and we're going to reassess it. So what I want you to do is sit. Try to keep your back straight. You're going to try to basically squish your belt by picking your one leg up as high as you can and then pick your other leg up as high as you can. Now for some of you, you might notice that there might be a difference from one side of your body to the other. And that's Normal, not ideal, but normal for people to have some differences. Once you figure that out, now I figured out kind of a range in which I can set my throne. So if I can lift my leg up three inches, I have this kind of from here down to about three inches in which I can set my throne up and stay in a place where my back isn't picking up too much motion. Now, once you've assessed some active range of motion, you've figured out how high you should start playing with sitting. The next question is, well, how wide are you going to make your legs, right? Because some of us, you know, multi-pedal orchestration is something that's become more popular lately. Are you going to make your legs really, really wide? Or are you going to make them really, really narrow? So there's a lot of double bass players that have these two bass drums and they're set out really, really wide. And it looks super cool. But if you forget about how it looks, because it realistically shouldn't be about how it looks. It should be about what's going to get you the best performance and, in my opinion, the safest performance. So if I just take my feet and I kind of place them a wide distance, I know this isn't a very good angle here, 
but I just take, place them a comfortable distance, I should say. You know, there's about three feet between my legs. Which means that if this is where I'm most comfortable, in my opinion, that's where your bass drum should be, and that's where your hi-hat should be, or second bass pedal, depending on what you're playing. Now, if I were on a slippery floor, or like a tile floor, I, what I would try to suggest you do is from this position of height you've picked, is try to slide your feet in and out, opening your legs and closing your legs, and figuring out how wide you can go. What you'll see very quickly is there's an amount of width that you can achieve without problems in your hips. But if you go too wide, you get to this really, really tense, crampy area. Now, if we add the first thing that we did, right, checking active range of motion, if I go to this really, really wide scenario, you look at a Terry Bozio and he's got all these crazy pedals, and you try to pick up your leg, well, you'll notice, like, I can get my leg up, but there's a lot less active range of motion there than there was at this comfortable position. Now, one thing that seems to happen with the human body is, is as you travel to an extreme of a joint in one plane, sometimes you lose motion in another plane. So here are the things that I'd ask you to consider. One, check your active range of motion with the leg lifting up motion. First, make sure your back straight. Try to pick your leg up as high as you can comfortably. Second, figure out how wide you want to play the pedals or what feels most comfortable with you, for you. Figure out where your bass drum wants to be, where your hi-hat is, play with that a little bit. Then reassess your hip flexion because you might find that you might lose motion or for some of you, you might actually pick up motion. Then after that, play. But here's the thing you also have to consider with all of that. Depending on what type of music you're playing, if you're playing heavier music, like double bass, your legs are going up and down. So now you've got to consider how much hip flexion you have when you're actually playing the pedal if you're bouncing your leg. If you're someone who's playing from your ankles more, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that as much. But these are all different things you need to consider. So I hope this has been a helpful video. I've never done anything like this before, so I hope this is a little bit helpful. If you want to know more about the anatomy, uh, more of the muscle tissue that's involved, or if you frankly just want more videos like this, please let me know. I'd be happy to help. I talk about human mechanics on a weekly basis with my team and physiotherapists in town, so I'd be happy to help you. Uh, and honestly, guys, happy drumming. Thank you so much for checking this out.